can go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ophira Serrano. I represent Quest Medical. I would like to introduce to you today Adam Cook, our speaker. He's the chief at Wellstar in Atlanta, Georgia. Please enjoy our sponsored lunch and Bloody Mary in the back. There's no line right now. Help me welcome Adam Cook. All right. All right. How's everybody doing? Thanks for joining me for this uh, lunch and learn, if you will. Um, hope everybody got a Bloody Mary. Um, listen to the last talk. It was a World War II talk. It was awesome. Uh, touches my heart. My grandfather was in the 101st Airborne, and um, that was a great job by Sherry. So we're gonna we're gonna shift gears here and go to a more clinical side of things. And I'm here today to talk to you about the Quest MPS and the KBC method, which is the method we use to uh, run cardioplegia for all cases at our hospital. So. <clears throat> Just for disclosures, I am here on behalf of Quest Medical because we use their machine and we like it a lot. Um, a little background about our hospital and our system. Uh, Wellstar is a regional medical center in Marietta, Georgia. And thank you. And we have 11 hospitals that the system owns, but Wellstar is the only one that does, does heart. So we get a lot of hearts from our feeder hospitals. Our chief of surgery likes to say that every patient that we get is a VIP, and we kind of use that mentality to, to dose our pledge, you know, personalized to every patient. Um, some of you may know Candace. She was the former chief before me. She's still at my hospital, but she got promoted, and I became the chief of the department back in November. So this is kind of her cardioplegia baby that she created um, seven years ago, and we've all been using it in clinical practice since. Um, so we have 10 full-time CCPs. We do about 1,300 hearts, at least last year. Three CT surgeons. We got three and a half ORs. One of them's a hybrid room. And as y'all probably know, the cath lab likes to hog those rooms and we don't really get them that much. Um, and then we do about 25 to 30 LVADs and 100 ECMOs a year. And we're getting busier on the ECMO retrieval side of things. So we're really growing. Uh, when I started in 2014, we had four people and now we have 10 and we're probably looking to hire soon. So um, so the topics of discussion for today, I'm going to give a short background on KBC, um, what it is, and then we'll go into the method and the dosing protocol that we use at the hospital. And then lastly, we'll touch on probably the most important part, which is the surgical team communication, because um, that's really what helps, uh, helps this work. So a lot of you are probably familiar with Del Nido. Um, it was developed as a pediatric solution. It's uh, typically given in one part blood and four parts crystalloid. It has high potassium, sodium bicarb as a buffer. The lidocaine provides sustained arrest, and the mag sulfate is a natural calcium channel blocker to keep the, keep the heart from wanting to contract while it's arrested. And then also there's mannitol uh, that acts as a free radical scavenger and pre prevents edema in the heart. So the KBC solution, we took a little bit away from the Del Nido and... Um, and went from there. So it is all blood. We don't use any crystalloid. Um, it's a high potassium solution. And then the other solution is lidocaine, mag sulfate, and mannitol. Uh, we don't use any buffer. We don't use bicarb in ours. We find that blood is a nice natural buffer. And all of those ingredients, none of them are super acidic anyway. So you don't really need a huge buffer. Uh, you can add bicarb if you want, but that's just kind of a preference. Um, so it provides a long sustained arrest and it uses nothing but the patient's own blood. So we find this beneficial in a few ways. Um, there's already a large burden for volume shifts on bypass, as you know, Pro uh, average priming volume is probably at least a liter for most centers, probably more. So you're giving that patient a liter when you go on pump and then you give them the Del Nido and you're giving them another liter immediately. So that's two liters of volume shifts. You all know you can hemoconcentrate it off. It's not hard. It's actually really easy. Um, but why give the volume in the first place if you don't have to? That's our philosophy. Um, it just, you know, you're trying to create controlled shock for the patient and make minimal changes throughout the procedure. That's the entire goal. Uh, so the less volume you give, the, the less of a physiologic change you're giving to the patient. Um, and it just, again, it avoids myocardial edema. And you can see here with this slide that 
was provided by Quest that the interstitial edema in the myocardial cells can, you know, it gets rid of that nice striated form that they're supposed to have. And it decreases the contractility when the clamp comes off and the heart's trying to beat on its own again. So this is the um, syringe we use. Our pharmacy prepares our additive syringe in-house and they have a seven day expiration. You can see the ingredients and percentages on there. Um, and it comes out to about 53 mils. And the only time that that changes is if the, sometimes they're out of 20% mannitol and we have to substitute for 25, in which case it's 47 mils. But either way, it's a very small package. And we, as we know, good things come in small packages. So it's great to just be able to give the patient around 50 cc's of volume um, and see a nice, easy, sustained arrest. Um, and we feel that the easiest way to accomplish this Maybe the only way to accomplish microplege is through the MPS. Um, we've been using this since the start of the program, since before I got to Kennestone. Um, so it's been almost 10 years. We're really looking forward to getting the MPS-3, which you can see over in the exhibitor's hall at any time. It has even more bells and whistles than the MPS-2, um, and it goes really well with like electronic charting and stuff like that. We'll talk more about that in a second. Um, but yeah, we customize everything we do in the OR, so why would we not customize our cardioplegia? That's the way we look at it. Um, and yeah, if you get a chance to use the MPS-3 over there and put your hands on it, I view it, view the MPS-2 and 3, I compare it as, you know, an old car versus a new car. The 1998 car will get you from A to B. It's a great ride. It does the job. Uh, but the 2015 car that has all the features and the bells and whistles is a lot safer. It's a lot easier to use, and it's going to make your trip a lot better. Same thing with a bypass run. The NPS is going to make your pump run a lot easier and more simple. It doesn't take all. It doesn't take a double roller pump setup or any of that stuff. It's just uh, it's pretty easy. So this is how we set up the NPS for any of y'all who have never used it or not familiar. Um, there's an additive pouch on the left. Um, we put that syringe that you saw earlier in that, and the potassium pouch on the right. We just use uh, regular two milliequivalents per mil potassium chloride. So we've got kind of the formula. Let's talk about the methodology and how we actually use it. So to talk about some comparisons, again, a little bit for Del Nino's pediatric heart, one to four ratio and single dose, KBC is similar, but also a good bit different. Um, it's all blood. We use the induction dose and then we use a dosing assessment which is probably the most important part of this uh, protocol and what makes it actually work is the collaboration with the team, the surgical team during the dosing assessment period. And then finally, we use a reanimation dose of warm blood at the end of the procedure. So it combines other aspects of cardioplegia and it's also a rest dose is enough in most cases, especially if you have short cross clamp times. Um, and it's a nice sustained arrest. I don't like to refer to it as one shot because it's not one shot for everybody. Um, all patients are different. The patient's the ultimate variable, as we all know. Um, but in most cases, the arrest dose is enough, and then you reassess it half an hour. Um, and if you're just getting used to it, you can reassess every 10 minutes if you want, whatever your surgeon, uh, whatever makes them comfortable. So for our induction dose, um, we do a weight-based dose. It's 15 mils per kilo, and that's off adjusted body weight. Adjusted body weight is, um, it's not your actual body weight and it's also not your ideal. Ideal is a little bit too stingy. Um, so we go kind of in the middle. Um, adjusted it's kind of in the middle of ideal and actual. And then regardless of your size, you're gonna get a minimum of a liter and a maximum of 1500. So, uh, you know, a little old lady's still gonna get a liter even if she weighs 55 kilos. And if you get that 150 kilo patient who's huge and you're thinking about upsizing your oxy and all that, they're still gonna get 1500. Um, we stop it there. It's delivered cold with the arrest setting of 21 and the additive setting of 18 or 21, depending on your strength of mannitol. So for our cases, we use this um, Excel spreadsheet. It really helps the team be on the same page with a lot of stuff. Um, and you enter the patient's info into it. It spits out the BSA. It tells you, you know, what your DO2 on pump is according to your hemoglobin and PO2. It gives you adjusted body weight, BMI, ideal BSA, heparin and protamine doses if needed. If your uh, HMS or whatever you use isn't giving you that, 
or you say it fails or something, you can use this as a guide, even though most good perfusionists should be able to spit out a protamine dose with head math. Um, this is a nice, good skeleton. There's also another thing that has ECMO cannulation sizes and everything. It's just a really good standard uh, calculation sheet. And you can see at the top right is the cardioplegia dose, and it's 1,230 for this particular patient. Um, but again, it's not rocket science. It's their weight times 15. So you don't need the sheet. It's just helpful. Um, so this is the amount of drug that's delivered in one liter of this cardioplegia, and it comes down to 2.5 grams of mannitol, uh, 1.6 grams of mag sulfate, 100 of milligrams of lidocaine, and 21 milliequivalents of KCL. Um, and that's just with the initial liter. So if you give more than, if you give 1,500, you're going to give a little bit more than this, but you know, 1.5 times this. Um, in general, none of this is a huge concern. Um, if you do give enough pleads, you have to start worrying about lidocaine toxicity. But that, in the, according to the literature, that starts around 800 milligrams. So you would literally have to give eight liters of this pleat. So that's, uh, I've never given that much on any case. I've never even come close. Um, so that's what you get with a liter. And then the next thing that we go to is the dosing assessment. And we usually do that about 30 minutes into the cross clamp period. So the dosing assessment is our guide. Um, and we always want to know how much longer. So we do an assessment about every half hour. Do we want to redose or do we want to just go ahead and fully rewarm, warm, rewarm the cardioplegia and get ready for our warm shot? So we, we take a couple things into consideration. Number one is the potassium level. What is it if it's, you know, five and a half? Uh, let's say you are starting to warm and you know it's probably going to go up from there. You can shut your K to zero and still give some um, additive with your redose if your surgeon chooses to redose. Um, remaining arrest time, how much longer is left in the procedure? You should probably know that as a perfusionist, but surgeons love to keep secrets, so um, you can just ask them how much time is left. Um, and then has there been any, any activity up to this point in the procedure, or is there a reason to redose um, based off the EKG? Um, so we take all these things into account, and then just to put it in sort of a flow diagram, um, you know, you can see at the top left there, we give the induction dose, and if it's inadequate or premature activity, we evaluate the delivery method, and then we redose at the surgeon's discretion. Um, the only thing that's kind of not accurate here is a 60-minute assessment. We usually do it at half an hour, um, but the 60-minute is a requirement. You have to do it at an hour, but most of us, the surgeons want to know every half an hour. Um, so these are the rhythms we never want to see when the clamp comes off, right? The VTAC and VFib, um, and your, your uh, surgeon's saying, drop amio, drop lido, drop all, uh, mag, drop it all. Let's just, you know, shock the heart and get them out of this. But there's a better way, at least sometimes, to avoid these rhythms. Sometimes they're going to happen no matter what, but we like to give the warm dose um, to help this, and I'm pretty sure that's a pretty universal um, principle with cardioplegia now. Most people give either warm blood until the heart starts beating or some, some form thereof of a warm shot before they reanimate. Um, it, it washes out everything that's still in the heart and it, you know, gets it more normothermic and ready to uh, receive the systemic blood that's at 36 degrees. So depending on the cross clamp period, um, we set our additive accordingly. If it has been a long time since we've given any pleage, we'll give the 21 additive and the warm. If it's been uh, less than 30 minutes, we'll give the zero. But 99 times out of 100, it's right in the middle. We give the additive at 10%. And... Um, it helps in a couple ways. The mannitol, again, is a free radical scavenger for when the clamp comes off. Um, the mag sulfate and the lidocaine both help with ventricular arrhythmias um, that we're, then they're given in the warm dose in the root. And we usually give about 400 mils through our MPS. Those are just the times that I was mentioning. Um, so the biggest thing in here is communication is crucial. I know that there's been polls of people who are afraid to speak up to their surgeons and Clinical mistakes happen because of that or whatever, but you just got to get out of your comfort zone and communicate with your team. And if they don't want to communicate with you, that's on them. Just keep communicating and doing your job. But this doesn't work as well without communication. So I put a couple of my favorite movie communication quotes on here just to drive that point home. But seriously, if you involve anesthesia and the surgeon, it works a whole lot better. Um, and you're all on the same page and you don't end up saying, well, why are you giving warm? I'm not ready. I got an hour left in the procedure. Well, if you would have communicated, you would have figured that out. So um, here's our perfusionist here using his clinical discretion and communicating with his surgeon. Um, again, we provide 
a little a lot of information is there any when we're deciding whether or not to redose is there any ekg activity what's the patient's k level what's the time since the last dose um, and then according to all that we can kind of dial in our additive and potassium settings where we want them um, and then where are we in the procedure? Like I mentioned earlier, uh, if, if you're already about to start rewarming, you probably don't need to redose um, at all. So, and then on the same page, it's on the surgeon to let you know. You, at our uh, facility, we have these little overhead cameras that are awesome and they take the guesswork out of what's going on at the field because you can see it. But I know a lot of uh, facilities don't have that luxury and all you see is the back of the surgeon's head and you might see his elbows come to the side when he's tying or something like that. But um, for the most part, communication is a lot harder um, without a direct camera on the heart. So um, it's on them, too, to communicate with you and let, let them know, let you know where they are at in the procedure so you can, you know, react accordingly. So we kind of refer to this as comfort dosing because a lot of surgeons um, are not used to not giving cardioplegia every couple minutes. When I started at Emory, there was a surgeon that wanted to do retrograde every two minutes, and he wanted to know every two minutes it was off. So you'd say retrograde's off two minutes, and you'd hear, rrr, rrr, and you wouldn't even know what to do. And then you do that 10, 15 more times throughout the procedure. So you're just guessing and playing this little game of I'm in charge, but you know, keep telling me what, keep telling me when plege has been off. And it just takes up a lot of time. It's cumbersome. And even if you do it the traditional way, give a root shot every 20 minutes. Um, I mean, if you have the DLPY, sure, it stays connected and it's real easy and it's kind of seamless, but you're still giving plege every 20 minutes. You're still filling up the heart every 20 minutes and changing the, the surgical field a little bit. So um, we think it really simplifies the procedure. It takes the surgeon's mind off of cardioplegia a little bit. It lets the perfusionist take over the plege. And, you know, it has really lowered our cross clamp times a lot because we're not spending time redosing. If we do redose, uh, we don't do a lot of retrograde at our facility. Um, it's usually either a root shot or just osteal delivery. Um, so that's, but the point of co comfort dosing is most surgeons are used to giving plege throughout their case, like, you know, clockwork, and this kind of takes that away. So in their head, they're like, shouldn't I be doing something cardioplegia wise right now? So it's hard for them to get used to. So when we started, they wouldn't even see activity, but they would give plege just in case. Um, and then we found that it was hard to get the heart to beat again because we gave too much plebs just based off being uncomfortable. Um, so anyways, what we like about the NPS too is you can step down. So let's say you're used to Del Nido, you can put that Del Nido up and hang it and set your NPS to crystalloid or one to four and you can run that Del Nido. And then let's say the next time you want to try, let's try half a liter instead of a liter. So hang half a liter of crystalloid, same amount of uh, additive, give that. Oh, wow, that worked just the same then take that completely away and then use a syringe. So you can baby step your way to getting to where the surgeon's comfortable. You don't have to change it overnight um, and you don't have to you know, change the way that your surgeon is used to. I mean, obviously that's his decision, but that's kind of uh, what our experience has been so far with it. And then just, this is just a graph that just kind of shows the MPS3. We haven't gotten one at our facility. I, I'm excited for when we do get one, but they're, you can play with the one here. Um, and I mean, you can give all blood single dose, Del Nido, um, Buckberg, Custodial, Plegisol. I mean, you can do anything with it. And then with the new one, those little pouches in the back come from pharmacy and you just click them in your machine and um, you're ready to go. So for us, we've been using it since 2016. So for seven straight years, we've used it on all of our patients. All three of our surgeons use it. Um, and like I said, we do probably close to Without Tavers, probably over a thousand hearts a year. Um, some of those we do warm beating. They don't arrest on a lot of our cabbages, but uh, for the most part, we give this pledge to every single patient for every single type of cardiac case. And um, we've had great results and we really like it. So that, that kind of sums up everything for the KBC, but um, I think we're gonna stick around and have plenty of questions from the audience. And, you know, we even have some some pre-made up questions, but if anybody has anything that they want to ask off the bat that's here or online, please feel free to do that now. And thank you, everyone. Very good. Thank you so much, Adam. And how this Shark Tank works is it's a, a, a audience participation 
And so we have some questions here, but we want even the people that have used it and have not used it and have used the older one and used the younger one, and even the pros and cons of people that think, I don't, you know, there's no way I'd ever use this thing. You know, we want to hear why. So this is a really good participation. Um, and we're going to have a mic here and one a mic over here. And then we have a traveling one, too. So for audience, for the virtual participants, too, we want to make sure that all the questions and comments and everything are um, with the mic also. So, Scott, you want to start us off with a question? Yeah, Adam, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. And just to get things started off here, we have a bar back here. <laughs> Um, show of hands, how many of y'all are currently using an MPS device, microplegia? Okay. How many of y'all are considering looking at the MPS and using it? Okay, nobody. All right. Of those people who are using the MPS device, how many are using a single dose method? One, two, three. Okay. All right. Um, Adam, maybe explain aside from the obvious things, but what are the advantages to going micro-dose, single shot versus multi-dose? Sure. Um, so, this I, again, I reserve to call it a single shot because it's not normally the case. The single shot will give you an hour of sustained arrest, but um, we do, you know, give maintenance doses. And usually, I, don't, I didn't say this, but the normal maintenance dose is 300 mils. And we turn the settings down to 10 and 10, or sometimes 3 and 3 on the, on the machine. So the benefits of having to give the single dose is it streamlines the surgery. You're not having to worry about, um, you know, give me 500 warm, then make it cold, and then give the next 300 retrograde. And, you know, none of that. You just give the plege and the root, and it, it usually works. Um, with the exception of maybe severe AI where you can either go retrograde or you can um, do what I like to call the, uh, the as, pretend my daughter's here, the half booty arrest where you uh, give 500 and then you slice the aorta open and then put the osteo in and give their other 500. Um, so, you know, the single dose really helps us in that way. Um, it just keeps everything a lot more simple. And, you know, the fact that all of our surgeons use it is even better because when I was at Emory, uh, there was 11 surgeons and all of them had their own plege protocol. And it was honestly extremely overwhelming when you're trying to be, you know, learn the profession to have 11 cardioplegia protocols to run heart surgeries. So um, to me, this makes it way simpler. Um, and I just, we just enjoy, enjoy the ease of just having the additive already prepared and just putting it in the machine. It's just simple. So. How many of y'all have been experiencing the CAPS problem recently, the CAPS recall? So don't be shy. I mean, this, the whole idea behind this lunch is Quest, we're learning from you all to provide products and services that you guys can use. Um, aside from that, what, you know, what are you doing? If you're, how many are doing Del Nido 1 to 4? Okay. So if all of a sudden CAP said you're no longer getting your Del Nido 1 to 4, are your pharmacies providing the, the solutions? Okay. If your pharmacy wasn't providing the solution or they had a shortage, what would you do? They need a microphone. Come on. No, we, we'd actually make it up ourselves, if, and we have in the past when we haven't had the solution. Okay, you would mix, you would compound the, the compound it yourself. Yes. How do you get correct. around that with pharmacy? <laughs> Just don't tell you don't them. Don't right? tell them. <laughs> Good strategy. <laughs> okay. But that's another benefit of it is it you know it's three ingredients in a syringe. You can mix it yourself super easily. I've done it in an animal lab, you know, just to try it because you can experiment on sheep and and pigs, you know, so you can. I've given it off the research line with two syringes in my hands and no MPS whatsoever, and the solution arrested the heart very well. So it's just, it's kind of amazing that you just throw three ingredients in together like that and they work, but it does work. Um, and we've seen it for seven years straight. So we used to collect a lot of data on all the cases, but it got to be really cumbersome for the perfusionist. Um, 
you know, what kind of rhythm did they have immediately? Was it normal? What was the rate? How long did it take to get to NS to normal sinus rhythm and all that? Um, but we hope with the MPS3, maybe we can start tracking data again because it's got a lot more data capabilities. Um, it'll tell you exactly how much you delivered from the machine and then that, that drug amount will cross over to your Cerner or your uh, Epic or whatever Emer that you use for your patient. So it just populates right in the chart and it's pretty nice. It keeps your totals for you. Comment on that too. Okay. Um, so I got to use MPS3 uh, at a location for about a year and a half. And I was always concerned about how much lidocaine I was given. And then sometimes the surgeon would be nervous and say, how much lidocaine, how much lidocaine? Mm -hmm. On the MPS3, you click two buttons on the touch screen and it tells you how much lidocaine you've given. So, Yeah. And the main reason that's an issue is not because you're going to give eight liters of cardioplegia. It's because the surgeon wants to know, can they give another 100 or 200 mm -hmm. through, you know, through anesthesia central line? And you don't want to give 200 if they've already had 500 yeah. or whatever. So that's great. a great point. You can just look it up uh, right away, um, bam, bam, on the machine. And, um, you know, you have the info right there instead of having to say, let me, let me figure that out real quick. So Yeah, it's right there for you. Yeah. Could I, ask, could I ask a question regarding that? Sure. We've had this discussion recently with lidocaine toxicity. It's um, the systemic lidocaine. But with the MPS, where you're delivering it right to the myocardium, do we have to, we, we've been debating this. Are we causing lidocaine toxicity at the myocardial level, even though the systemic lidocaine isn't that much? I, I'm just throwing that out. I sure. haven't been able to find anybody that's really addressed that. Yes. I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. I mean, I get does what any, you're saying. Has anybody address that i mean I, I haven't been able to find anything so sure i just present it because you're taking a whole body toxicity and then yeah we're saying know, versus 800 a, you know you know a couple pounds milligrams for a whole body but when you're delivering it right to the heart is, mm -hmm. is there a, a you know at what point do we get toxicity i don't know the answer to that but i would say just out of you know caution to have a lower threshold for sure than the 800 but um it's probably a good point. I would say 800 is a good number for systemic based on the literature. Yeah. And, you know, like, like he said, since the heart weighs just, a, you know, a very small portion compared to the whole body, you just might want to be extra careful. Um, from the chat, someone asked if it was being used, the KBC, in robotic surgery at all. Do you know if that's... Um, I'm not sure. We don't do robotic surgery at my facility. Um, I, I'm sure you could use it in a robot case. If you had a way to give pleage, then you can use this pleage. Ba basically, you just got to establish a delivery route, and if you have that, then, you can, then, then it will work. Good question. Well, initially... Initially, you said you were wanting feedback on it. So um, sure. a few years ago, I was at Duke University, big center, um, 36 perfusionists, and we trialed the MPS for like four months. We could barely use two cases because by the time everybody got through it, it's like you just, oh, it was overwhelming. And because we had so many surgeons, everybody wanted their own protocol and wanted their certain, you know, whatever, and it just didn't work out. But now I'm in a small center where there's only four of us and we have the MPS and it's like unbelievable. I can't believe that you can't get like the Duke surgeons or somebody to sit down and watch how little at the end of my case, I'm like, I gave 20 mLs of like, you know, yeah. and we have perfect arrest and it is really, uh, it's just a phenomenal device. It's, however, like you said, at a center that large, it's hard to get. And every year we hire six, seven new people. It's just turnover, turnover. We take new grad students and it's, you can't keep people, you know, you can't practice it every day because you're, you're hardly pumping. You're, there's so many of you. So, but now that I, I've got used to it, wow, it's, it is amazing. Yeah. You can titrate. If your K is up, you just turn it down or you can give the purge and just shoot one little, you know, dose of it. So yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's so really nice that we can't really stress to the students that we teach that this is not really how pleage works out there in the real world for most cases. Like, cause like I said, I came from, training where you have to be on it every two, five, 20, 10, 20 minutes for cardioplegia. And they just see it arrest. And then they set a 30 minute timer and it's just 10 times easier. Um, 
which is nice. And another point is when you do give Del Nido, you put a leader in, but you don't always get a leader out from your human concentrator. So it's not, it's not an even switch. It, I mean, I think we all know if you've ever tried to uh, buff it, like get the K down and you start pouring in normal saline before you know it, you've only got three liters off the patient and you've put four and a half in and your crits drop. It's not, it's not always zero balance. That's just what they call it. So, um, if you don't have to give the fluid in the first place, in my opinion, it's just better to look down and see you just gave 53 mils and that's all it took to arrest the heart. So I agree with you. Well, and also I think you said your center always gives a leader. And what I found is if it's a short case, you can bump really high and he's always like, oh, we have a rest. That's 200 in. He's like, then just give 600. I mean, yeah. sometimes that's all it takes for a cabbage times two or three and depending on the surgeon and the speed, but it, again, you don't have to go always a liter minimum or more. It's just, you can just titrate it so easily. It's, it's really fabulous. So. Yes. We've started doing a liter for all our cabbage patients, regardless of size for, for what you said, it's usually pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, it's, it's nice. We like it a lot. I have a quick question. Sure. If you don't mind. Um, I've used it at one of the hospitals I work at and we just, we end up not using the additives. We just give straight Del Nido through it. So it's basically just doing the same thing as any other pump would do. Um, but my question, my main question is, do you have some, any sort of cost benefit analysis that you've done? I know you said you don't have outcomes on, you know, before you use the MPS versus after, but I'm curious what the pitch is to, to get a, a, an institution to purchase this machine like, do you have a difference in cost between just the additives you're using versus a bag of Del Nido, which is cheap as dirt anyways? And also, just a, a second thought, not every place that uses Del Nido is using like 1,200, you know, to arrest the heart or 1,500. We'll often use like 700 mils for a cabbage times three because our surgeons are super fast. You know, we typically have like a 30-minute, 45-minute cross-clamp time. Mm -hmm. So, Okay, so you're already using the NPS at your facility? We're, One we're using it at High Point, uh, North okay. Carolina, but it's a, it's a funny situation, but we don't do that many. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know the cost benefit um, numbers. I don't have it all well oiled out in my head or anything like that. Um, I just know from the patient care side of things that I really like it. From the business management side of things, um, you can get a cheaper cardioplegia set, but we all know they're harder to prime, they're harder to use, and like I said, the NPS is just super easy and simple. It makes the clinicians more comfortable. It makes the surgery, the surgery go more streamlined. And I guess if you were to look at the literature, at least at our facility, you would see the clamp times have gone down significantly just by not having to worry about cardioplegia as much. Um, so that right there, lower clamp time and lower pump time is really all the evidence I need. I don't, I'm, I'm not, I don't want to say I don't care about cost because that's not true. Uh, everyone has to care a little bit, but um, at this point in my career so far, I, all I really uh, care about is that it works really well clinically, and I can hope that my administrators care about that too. If it costs a little bit extra, then they can afford it. Um, but that's just my point. I know that most people want to see the numbers. They want to see the breakdown, but I guarantee you that if you were, well, I shouldn't guarantee, but I bet that if you did look at it, um, you know, you would find pretty comparable numbers by the time it's all said and done with everything that's involved. Cause you know, you don't have to set a hemoconcentrator concentrator up. I don't know the cost of that, but you don't have to throw that in the circuit. There's just a couple things you don't need that would immediately probably even out the cost. Um, so yeah, that's, I, I wish I had a better business oriented answer for you, but um, I just love the machine clinically and I let the upper, the higher ups worry about the numbers until they come down on me. So thank you. What about the learning curve from the, um, the MPS versus the newer one with the more computerized? And um, what are you guys finding about that? I know I trained on the earlier one, and then I went to one of our other new accounts as a traveler, and these younger perfusionists taught me how to do, or were trying to teach me how to do it. No, did a good job. But I um, wanted to know the other um, opinions from everybody else that's used the switched over, their learning curve on that. Good, bad? Yeah, I would be interested to hear that because we haven't gotten a chance to use the three yet. So, is this thing on? Yeah. All right. 
So I haven't used the MPS3, uh, but we do use the MPS2 in our facility. And I was excited actually when you started talking because I thought I'd learn a kind of novel, interesting new way to give cardioplegia. But it turns out we do almost exactly the same thing. Yeah. Um, and we do what the other fellow mentioned earlier. We mix up our own drugs. So we go around the pharmacy as well. It's uh, incredibly easy. Yeah. Um, but to kind of answer the last question that was just presented, um, I just walked in the other room, was looking at the MPS3. Like I said, I'm very familiar with the MPS2 at this point. And I just poked some fingers around on the screen. And I think that I could have probably delivered a cardioplegia dose right there. It, it's yeah. incredibly intuitive. Um, it looks like a smartphone screen. Um, you just read the things on the screen and, and you know what to do. So that's uh, my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I agree with that. And I mean, it tracks a lot more things too. It tracks your time to arrest and dose given and all that stuff. So it's, it's a lot more uh, data driven too. Riley and I know he could do it in like one case, but um, we had a lot of travelers at my facility. And if they were MPS2 users, we had them on the MPS3 within two procedures. You know, um, if I could get the Quest folks scheduled, they would come out and do a nice in service for them. But I couldn't always make the schedule work when the travelers were there. So I could show them a lot of the things are protocolized. And within one or two cases, they had it. Easy switch. I have a lot of questions on the virtual too. Wanted to know about the education for the, is there any education uh, modules online with the MPS for, to be able to review? We are currently working on that <clears throat> to get those online. Uh, those should be within the next month or so. Working on that, yes. Um, the MPS3 is very user intuitive. If you can use an iPhone, you can use an MPS3. The great thing about the MPS3 is the data management. Uh, it will store over 255 cases, which those of you who are, who, how many chiefs of perfusion are in here right now? Okay, you can basically, that data transfers in spreadsheet format for you. So you can basically compare apples to apples, apples to oranges and things like that, which should help you in uh, budgeting. As far as product savings or cost savings, Quest has done studies in the past, and I know Adam's aware of this, that by simply using the Quest, uh, they did a study that simply the LOS was reduced by one to two days in patients. And their length of time on uh, ventilators was greatly reduced as well, which is a good thing. So it's, it should be on the Quest website. But if not, find me over in the booth and we'll, we'll get it for you, okay? All right. Oh, I was going to say we've had the experience of using the MPS3 for quite a few months at the University of Utah and, yeah, and used the MPS2 before. It was a really simple transition, not a... Question, I was just answering what we were talking about before with the ease of transitioning to from an MPS2 to an MPS3 and, and confirming how simple it really is to... To do that, um, but I did want to ask you. Uh, you mentioned your subs, your your redoses are three hundred every time, mm -hmm. and then do you go thirty minutes after um, that three hundred, or kind of what's your time frame from redosing to when you'll consider redosing again? It's typically thirty minutes. Um, most of our procedures are pretty fast. Um, I, I think the uh, you know most clamp times are in double digits, and we'll probably only give two pleat shots, the induction dose and a redose maybe kind of procedure, but in like a root or a redo or an aorta, um, we'll, we would give it um, probably two or three times every 30 minutes. And just um, at that point, we would have our additive pretty well dialed down to either 10 or five. And then um, the K would just depend on what the K in the case was at that point. So, and if we see any activity, you know, you just bump everything and back up to high and, and try to try to get rid of the activity and go from there. Thank you. No, this seems like a great uh, alternative to just straight Del Nido the whole time. Our institution, we have long cross clamp times, long bypass times. And what we've been doing is we'll give up to two liters of regular Del Nido and then our surgeons switch over to microplegia after. So it's, so the MPS three has been really nice or even the twos that we still have that right through the case will just 
switch from Del Nido to Micro if we've given a lot of Del Nido. So, yeah, which is, yeah. I mean, that's awesome just to be able to do that because you can't do that with a, a, you know, a normal cardioplegia setup. So, yeah. And so, I mean, you can run 11 different protocols or you can one, run, you know, one protocol five different ways on the fly if you want. Um, it's, it's just easy to switch. And it sounds like the three is even easier. It has like an auto start that will ramp up to the root pressure you pre-put and then just you just hit the button and it does it. And it's not to take away from us as clinicians and knowing, you know, how to arrest the heart without these fancy machines. You should still obviously know that but it is about ease of workflow and making your concentration on the patient and the procedure and what's going on and not having to worry as much about cardioplegia. It's, it shouldn't be something that takes, you know, extreme thought just to run. It should just run. And if there's any problems, then you know how to fix them because it's a relatively simple machine. How could this help an institution that uses custodial and Buckler four to one? Um, well, to be honest, it just would depend on your institution. I'm not sure you could still give it with this machine, but I don't know. Are you looking to continue to give it with a different machine? Or are you looking to change the way you give cardioplegia with Buckberg and Custodial? That's our standard right now is one of the two for long, uh, procedures. It's custodial and for standard cabbages, we use the Buckberg four to one. Uh, resting dose like everyone else, and then subsequent doses after each distal, after each brock. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know this, but it seems like it would work under the same principle as Del Nido. If you can take the fluid out of the buckbird and, and just use the the uh, drugs that you know that really cause the arrest and hold the sustained arrest and all that, and take the ingredients out and leave the. I honestly don't even know what's in buckbird. Is it plasmolite or normosol or Plegisol. Okay. So, I mean, you can take that out. And it, but again, I don't want to tell you to do something at, at your practice that hasn't been researched or anything like that. But it would seem logically that you could do the same thing that you did with Del Nido with Buckberg or with uh, Plegisol if you wanted to just take away the chrysalid aspect and leave the drugs. You can certainly. Uh, do you mix blood with your custodial? Okay. There are some institutions that we have or customers that their, their surgeons want the custodial pink tinged. Well, quantitatively, what does pink tinged mean? So according to the custodial uh, uh, website, they can go with a 10% dilution blood in their custodial. With the Quest, you would run that uh, one to nine. In that way, it is exact every single dose rather than, well, what I consider pink tinge and what you would consider pink tinge are two different things. Okay, but please remember the Quest also offers, you know, I've, I've been doing perfusion for over 33 years. How many of you, when you first got into perfusion, there was a certain cardioplegia protocol that everybody followed? Okay, and that was the accepted, that was it. That's what everybody uses. And then maybe five years out or six years out, then another cardioplegia protocol comes in. That's the new thing. Okay, so it changes from year to year. So I understand the custodial, I mean, sorry, custodial, that Del Nido is the end all be all right now. And it may very, <coughs> very well be, <coughs> excuse me, but the chances of it changing or the chances of a new technique coming out within the next few years is quite possible. The Quest allows you to be flexible, okay? It also allows you to have, the Quest will hold 66 different protocols, as this one woman had, had, had said earlier, and that's true, which makes it, a, uh, you come in the morning, Dr. So-and-so is doing this case, okay, they require this protocol, boom, you punch it in, the Quest takes care of all of that for you, okay? Another doctor uses a different protocol. The Quest is one machine, one disposable for 66 different protocols. Whereas you might have to have 66 different disposables on your shelf to cover everything. Okay, so there's cost savings there as well. The question I wanted for you, Adam, is since you guys started using uh, the, the KBC solution to your institution, had you seen a reduction in AKI or any changes in AKI? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, so Candace was tracking that 
initially, and we did see a big reduction in AKI over time. I don't know if we can attribute it solely to the quest because we also, you know, initiated DO2 and uh, monitoring. We use DO2 of 275 for blood transfusion triggers. So if our DO2 drops under 275 and usually the hemoglobin is seven and a half or lower anyway, then we give blood. So we're a little bit quicker to give blood than we used to because of that. Um, and that led to a reduction in AKI, but we've also been using the Quest and PS that, that entire time. Um, so it, it stands to reason that it probably didn't hurt us in that data. Um, and also, again, um, it allows you to avoid all this unnecessary fluid. If the kidneys aren't working, then why, you know, why would you put more fluid on board for them to have to get rid of? So I think that, um, that just thinking about it logically, that it puts less burdens on the kidneys to, to give less fluid in general. So. This is a cost question. Um, like, if some institutions want to use the Quest MPS, but it's cost prohibitive at the moment, do you guys like let them use it and buy the disposables, or do you have any kind of programs <laughs> to let them do that kind of stuff? <laughs> Working? Oh, there we go. Hi. Um, we can set up an evaluation to come into the hospital where you guys can use the machine. Um, we'll provide a few disposables for you free of charge, and the rest you will go ahead and purchase them. Um, and we can also f further discuss and see what we can work with the account with you. Feel free to stop at the booth, and I'll give you my business card, and we'll take it from there. There's a question from the chat um, okay. asking, how do you suggest troubleshooting during a case, specifically if the screen freezes during delivery? Um, this happened to this person's colleague a couple times, and has that happened to you? Um, we've had, a, not a lot, but we've had over seven years, we've had plenty of issues with the machine. Um, I would say 99 times out of 100, you can shut it off and on, and it works just fine, just like a modem or anything else. Shut it off and on. Another thing you can do is if you're in a protocol, it has all these settings. You can go back out of that and start your own protocol and reset the settings. But they're talking about a, a completely blank screen. I've never seen that. But um, what I would do is just run it at a, a conservative pressure and flow. And, you know, just like we normally do a root pressure on the machine of around 300. And we assume a pressure drop of 50 up to the root. So 250 at the aortic root. I would probably just err on the side of caution and give, or you know, you can always switch it out and get another unit in the room that the screen works on. Um, if it happens mid-delivery, then that's what I would suggest, just uh, using conservative settings and monitoring the rest and make sure everything appears normal. But if it's uh, you're completely driving blind and you're not confident, I would call for backup or uh, get your, we have an extra machine sitting there uh, waiting if something like this happens. And we have like competencies and we practice NPS changeouts and we have had to do a handful of them over the years, but not very many. So most things can be avoided with off and on. I can assist in answering that question. Um, we do have an emergency line that we can connect from the inlet, from the oxygen or going into the Quest. You will go ahead and connect that to the tubing and it'll connect to the underneath of the heat exchanger and pump. And you will just give with uh, your forward flow from the pump. And it also has a clamp on it, so you can go ahead and clamp it out once done. Thank you. That's with the three, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's only with a three. So she's saying that you can, if the NPS unit fails, you can use your cardio, you can use your CPB pump and connect to that and use that as the driving pressure for the, for the NPS. So it's kind of a workaround for failure if it does happen. Yeah, we do have a hand crank, but uh, we've never, never used it for that. If you have problems arresting the heart, just put the blood back in the heart and tell the surgeon to calm down while you switch out the NPS. <laughs> I know it won't go over that well, but I mean, that's, that's just the reality at that point, you know? <laughs> uh, I mean, if I'm willing to get yelled at, yeah, it works for me. <laughs> 
<laughs> I just say same team, man. Same team. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, question for you, Adam. Sure. Um, have you used that KCB solution with the MPS? Have you used it with Warm? Um, we so we use the same solution when we warm it up for the reanimation dose. Um, is that what you mean just giving it for the warm shot before you take the clamp off? No, as a warm arrest. Um, we have not, but I think that's more of a preference thing. Like I know a lot of surgeons like to start warm so they don't shock the heart right away with six degree blood or whatever it is. Um, so you could use that for sure. Um, you just start it warm and then switch the temp over to cold about halfway. You probably have to switch it a little early because it takes time to cool it down. But you could definitely start warm and then go cold. Um, so I was just yeah. asking based on one of our surgeons does um, warm for, through his old whole cabbage. He'll do warm. Oh, he just does all yeah, warm? it's always. Okay. Yeah. So um, yeah, you that. can give it all warm. Does he ever have any activity or issues with activity? Um, once in a while, but we read, he redoses. We remind him every two minutes, and he redoses fairly often. So, so I was he just, just curious if you've tried using the KCB with um, warm. That's all. We, we haven't tried it throughout the entire case, but that's more just because our surgeons don't have that as their preference. But um, I'm pretty sure that you could do it pretty easily. You just leave it warm. It's actually just one less thing to worry about, the temperature of it. So. Um, yeah, you could definitely do that. And then another question about um, how you were saying that you could, if, if the machine fails, you could run the blood from the pump into the pleage. Can you use that with the drug or no? Would it would just be just blood to the heart at that point um, with the MPS3? Oh, it, it would, I think it still delivers the drug, correct? It's, Thank you. Thanks. So it sounds like you have to give your drugs manually if you do the workaround. Okay. I have a question that it's just a simple question, but I saw on the PowerPoint there was a bubble about cold agglutinins. Mm -hmm. Does that have anything to do with the actual machine, like setting it to that specific threshold, or it's just the heater cooler, like? what you would set it to? Um, that's a great question. I added that slide last night and I knew somebody was going to ask about the cold agglutinins. <laughs> <but laughs> um, I think it's probably the way you set the machine. It makes sure that it won't get too, too cold, um, you know, with the protocol. So I, I think that's just a way that you can preset it and give the, uh, a cold agglutinin protocol based on, like you said, you can do 66 protocols. So I'm assuming that, uh, that that's one of them, the cold agglutinin protocols, and you can, adjust it to your institution specific protocol, I guess. So thank you. Mm -hmm. I know that wasn't the best answer, but uh, Scott and Ophira can definitely help you out with a better one if you uh, want to talk to them. I've so. seen it. So that's why I was curious with oh, that you've specific. Used it? No, just cold gluten. So I was wondering if you could make sure it no matter what with your heater cooler and that system, it wouldn't go below that threshold or whatever. Yeah, I think that that's patient. probably the point of it. it yeah. It, um, if they're advertising it, that seems like what the, what the point would be. Do you all know? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. How many have had all the gluten in their career? Will you ever forget it? No. <laughs> Thank you. For the cold agglutinins, you would go ahead and change the temperature on the pump. Um, I had a few years ago where I've used the MPS2 and I had a cold agglutinins, and you can you see it very visibly on there. Um, and the surgeon just directed me to go ahead and change the temperature, and within about a minute or two, the temperature has changed, and we've proceeded with cardioplegia. Uh, thank you, Doug Vincent, VentureFlow. I'm curious, what was the origin story of this solution, you know, and why... Was, was the timing and, and as well as the cocktail, how was that, how did, what's the, how the drive? Um, I would have to give Candace credit for that. This is kind of the KBC, you know, at one point stood for, her last name is Kaylin, and then another perfusionist that was there, Barry and then Surgeon Cooper. So it was the three of them operating, so it became KBC, but now we just call it Kennestone Blood Cardioplegia because that's our hospital. Um, 
so it, I think it was just an idea that came into her head one day, like, why are we giving all this fluid when we don't have to? And then luckily, uh, our surgeons let us try it out. And, uh, it, it kind of was like, this is way better than anything that we've been doing. So we just kept on doing it and it grew from there. Um, so it started as an, as just an idea and, you know, she's done countless hours of research and, uh, literature reviews and stuff behind all of this. So, um, a lot of research went into rolling this out. Um, but it started as just an idea from a, a seasoned perfusionist and it just kind of went from there, at least at our institution. I'm sure other places have had the similar idea and copied it as well. Um, it's not like copyrighted or anything, but, um, yeah, it's a great, it's a novel idea and I think it led to a, a really good strategy. So. There's a question from the chat about if there are, if you know of any studies or if you've done any studies that compare the incidence of arrhythmias since switching to the MPS. Um, we have not done any studies ourselves. We were collecting firsthand data uh, to track the arrhythmias after the cross clamp came off. But like I said, we were doing it, we didn't even have electronic charting. We were doing it on little strips of paper. And um, as everybody here knows, that's probably the time where you need to pay attention the most in the procedure when the clamp comes off and you're about to wean. So uh, that's probably our weakest uh, thing is we don't really have a ton of data other than firsthand experience that we've all used. We were tracking the data uh, for a long time, but I don't have anything to compare it to in the literature. There's no formal article that says the arrhythmias are less with this method than any other. So. One more trick question. <laughs> I just have more of a comment. We actually use that exact protocol at our hospital, and it works really good. We'll do microplegia for our cases that are going to be a lot quicker, which is nice because you can tailor everything. And then we, we do do Del Nido. It's this KBC in this exact settings that you were showing. Same with 1,000 or 1,500 max, and then our redosing intervals and just what we see is it works really well. Yeah. Yeah, if anything, most cases it works too well. And you, you, you know, surgeons now, if they've done it for three or five years, they're kind of being more cautious with how much they give. But we see very few patients that come, you know, the clamp comes off and there's nothing. There's no rhythm, there's nothing. Usually they come back spontaneously or you just poke them or you pace them for a second and then take the pacer off and they're, they're back. A couple of questions about how you would go or if you have any advice for trying to convince certain surgeons to switch their style of cardioplegia to a different one. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's a great question. You got asked a few times, so yeah. I figured I'd... Well, I mean, we all know that surgeons are going to do what surgeons want to do, so that's, that's the hardest part, obviously. Um, but my recommendation would be to get with uh, Scott and Ophira and, get, and pull literature and take it to your surgical team and show what other centers have done and then um, ask if they'd be willing to do a trial and they could, you know, the Quest folks could help you out with that and just let them see it. And after they see it, they'll probably believe it, but they're not gonna believe anything they don't see. We, you know, we mock what we don't understand and this is a perfect example of that. So that they like to stay to what they're used to. Um, but my opinion would be to pull clinical data and research and then try to show it to them firsthand and, uh, and see what they say then. Hey, we use a, I come from Raleigh and uh, Wake Mid. We use KBC, every, all the surgeons have switched over from it. Nobody uses Del Nido anymore. Uh, my question to you though is, because you're giving 260 milligrams of lidocaine in the dose of, uh, per liter, that's what we do. Um, are you restricting any of your lidocaine use like after the clamp comes off in fear of like seizures and some other things? Um, we use it as our drug of choice for antiarrhythmias after the clamp comes off. We'll give Amio yeah. as the first thing um, okay. and then we give mag next, and then we usually give Lido as our third resort, but just because of that fact. For so. restriction. And yeah. uh, so when you're coming off and like when you see it works too well, it really does in a sense. We yeah. go an hour, and maybe, maybe an hour, a little bit more than an hour uh, before we redose. And then our redose is, uh, is only about like 300 cc's mm -hmm. just so you don't run into that. Do you run warm blood afterwards for about a liter or maybe a 1,200 cc's just to try to wash out some of that lidocaine? Uh, we usually just do 400, but we have two very impatient surgeons and they don't want to wait. We have another one that likes to run it until he sees, you know, some activity. 
and then he'll then he'll stop. Uh, but typically we keep it to 400. But I know a lot of surgeons that love to just give warm blood, uh, like until they see some EKG activity. So sure, great, great, great presentation, man. Uh, thank you. Thank you all very much. This is a very good session. Great discussion. Great input. Thank you very much.